Pioneer Need Warriors, the topic of your demand has finally arrived and that is your wave optics. I hope I'm audible, visible, seen properly. Good evening, good evening, my dear students. Yes, most of you demanded this particular topic and uh, on demand, uh, we are doing this particular wave optics. Remember, we have already done simple harmonic motion. We have done waves on a string, sound waves, uh, all of this has been done. So this was one of the important topic and uh, we are completing this in the final over. Hello, Sanvi, Saita, Krishna. Hello, Ukan, Ukman. Hello, believe in you. Good evening, my dear students. Good evening. Happy evening. All the warrior Pandus have assembled right over here. Thank you so much for all the lovely welcome. And uh, let's proceed with this particular chapter of wave optics where we are going to see interference, Young's double slit experiment, polarization, diffraction and your basic hygiene principle, right? So all of this in today's session with me, your Captain Shreyas, who has been mentoring and training kids for a very long time. And this year too, we are going to nail it because if you have been regular on this channel and if you have been putting the trust on us, then I 100% believe that you are going to get really amazing marks and you will be messaging all of us, you know, after a couple of months, from a good, good, good government college or Ames or Jipmer, where you would be so proud of the journey that you had with us on this channel. So all the best to you and make sure you smash the like button to shower your love. And yes, of course, to mark your attendance. That is very important, right? So let me also remind you that I am coming to your city slowly, slowly, slowly. Every city will be conquered. So the first city that I'm coming is Pune, then Vizag on 23rd and 24th I'm going to be in Hyderabad and Tamil Nadu students coming there very soon. So get ready for the awesome interactions because it's not just about meeting me but it is a whole different experience and yes there will be a lot of fun activities, a lot of goodies to be uh, you know one and also let me tell you there are a lot of surprises which are planned in these particular events like the event which is happening in pune tomorrow it's in a mall right it's in a big thing because there are more than thousand students who have already you know expressed their interest who are going to come out there with their parents so please spread the word uh, regarding these events be it in vizag or in hyderabad this is one of its kind and yes uh, if you are not able to make it no issues uh, you can always visit our vedantu learning center where we have an amazing offline team with lots and lots of facilities like smart clickers, smart boards, uh, doubt counters, library facilities, smart classrooms with a lot of interactive elements. Experience this. Okay. I have put up the list of the cities where Vedantu learning centers are. These are our offline centers. In case you are not having uh, the facility, then you can always enroll in the online batches. But if you have this opportunity, make the best use of it right so these are amazing centers please visit these centers you will understand what i'm saying it might just feel like an offline center from here but it is a game changing experience it is not like any other offline center because i have a lot of fun in these matches trust me on that okay so let's begin with a, a wave what is exactly a wave and what do i uh, you know mean by a light wave see in uh, the 11th standard topic of wave, I had already told you that wave is nothing but a way or the manner in which energy goes from one point to the other. Good evening, Steve. Hello, Shabri. Hello, Ma Mali, Mangesh. Hello, crazy dude. Hi, hi, PWLH. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yes, uh, even a J student can also watch it. No issues because concepts are the same, but the question level will be of need. Please remember that. So, wave is nothing but a method of transfer of energy where the particles stay intact. It's just that the energy goes from one point to the other. Like when I'm talking, it's not that the air is coming into your ear. It's only the energy which gets transmitted via the medium of air. So, that is nothing but a wave. So, a disturbance produced is getting transmitted. Now, uh, there are many kinds of waves, sound wave. Earthquake is a wave, sea wave, ripples of water and even light or even electromagnetic radiation. 
this chapter particularly deals with light. In light, when I say it means electromagnetic waves, usually, you know, which is seen by the human eye. Electromagnetic waves are, you know, a broad range of frequencies and wavelength. Radio waves, Bluetooth signal, Wi-Fi signal, X-rays, infrared, ultraviolet, gamma rays, cosmic rays, microwaves. All these are electromagnetic waves. What is so special about them? You will see that there is electric field which is changing. Look, 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 look. It will keep on changing. It will keep on oscillating. Right? So, you will see electric field will keep on changing. And at the same time, you will see a magnetic field is also being generated and that will also keep on changing perpendicular to each other. So, you will have varying electric fields and varying magnetic fields. These both will happen simultaneously and that will create your electromagnetic wave. If that wavelength lies between 400 to 700 nanometers, right, you should know about this. So, if the wavelength lies between 400 to 700 nanometers, 400 to 700 nanometers roughly, right, you will see, you will see that that is basically your visible spectrum. That is basically your visible spectrum of light. That is basically your visible spectrum of light. Anything above 700 will become infrared. Anything below 400 nanometers will become ultraviolet. So, this is what is the meaning of visible light or just light. Okay, right. And I have a very cool animation to show you how to uh, imagine waves as. So, just look at this particular animation which is there just one second where did it go <laughs> yeah i hope you will be able to see this okay just look at this I hope you are able to, um, you know, see this particular screen where, you know, you are probably going to see some small animation out there. So, imagine this is a tap and there is a knob over here and this is uh, like the surface of the water. So, if I turn on the tap, a disturbance is created and you will see that the disturbance propagates. These are nothing but waves on water. But this exactly is what happens when you think of light. So, the light bulb that light bulb is like the disturbance, like the water falling in that medium. So, you know, that disturbance which is there, think of light bulb as like the disturbance and the disturbance propagates, it spreads in all the directions. So, you can see these wave fronts which are expanding, those circles which you see, they are called wave fronts which are expanding. Wave fronts is basically the front part of the wave which keeps on expanding. These are all the points, you know, which are equidistant from the source. They are all equidistant from the source. Those are those points on that circular arcs. And you will see that they are continuously expanding. So, those are wave fronts. And the disturbance propagates in that particular medium. So, you will see there are at regular intervals. So, from one disturbance to the next disturbance, it will be the wavelength. It will be the wavelength. I can change the frequency. You can see that if I change the frequency, the wavelength will also change. See, I have changed the frequency. The wavelength has suddenly changed. Low frequency, large wavelength. Around say, coolly it is falling. If I increase the frequency, tuck, 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 you will see that, you know, the wavelength will definitely decrease. When frequency increases, the wavelength will reduce. You can see that. Isn't it amazing, my dear students? Yeah, you can see this is the top view and this is the side view. This is the side view of it, right? See, these are the ripples of the water. This was from the side. The same thing on the top will look like this. So, these are what your waves are. You can think of light waves also like these electric field variations which are created by the disturbance being generated by the light bulb, light source, lamp, fire, whatever it is. Okay, so that is what a light wave is. Great. Shall we proceed ahead? I hope you are able to uh, visualize all of this. Right. Yeah. Super, right? This animation was super. Write the word super if you loved the animation. 
Yes. Yes. Very nice. Cool. Let's move on. Let's move on now. So wavefront. What is wavefront? Like I showed you those wavefronts which are expanding. They are imaginary surfaces which oscillate in unison. That means all the points will have same field. All the points will have the same disturbance. Everything goes up and down together. Everything goes up and down together. So all those points are basically a part of the wavefront. And there are multiple wavefronts created one after the other. One wavefront goes ahead, the next wavefront comes behind it, the next wavefront comes behind it. This is a continuous process. So it's a locus of all the points which have the same phase of oscillation, which has the same phase of oscillation. And this is exactly what I showed you right over here by dropping water droplets. You saw those ripples of water which were created and they spread and they spread in all the possible directions. Now, one, another important thing about uh, the wavefronts is that, say for example, say for example, I tell you, listen, this is a wavefront. Example, this is a wavefront which is there. Then the next wavefront was, let's say, over here before this or after this. And then next wavefront is over here like this. Okay, I'm just showing some random wavefronts. If I draw a perpendicular to it, if I draw perpendicular to it, right? What does that perpendicular give me, my dear students? What does that perpendicular give me? This perpendicular basically gives me the ray of the wave. In case of light, it will be the ray of light. The ray of light, that means the direction. It is basically the direction of propagation. It is basically the direction of propagation. It is the direction of basically propagation. That is the ray of light and the wavefronts and the wave fronts you will see are the locus of all the points which are going to oscillate together. They will always be perpendicular to each other. No matter where you go, you will see that they will be perpendicular to each other. So that is why I'm showing this perpendicular symbol. I hope this is very, very clear. Right? Clear? Awesome. Awesome. Moving ahead. Moving ahead. Now, Depending on how the source is, you can have different types of wavefronts. One is a spherical wavefront, second is a cylindrical wavefront, and the third one is a planar wavefront. So, the best way to visualize these wavefronts is by taking an example of that source which creates this wavefront. The best example for a source which creates spherical wavefront is a light bulb. Example, example, a light bulb. A light bulb is basically like a point source, is like a point or spherical source, is a point or a spherical source of light. So the wavefronts which come out of it are also spherical in nature, meaning you will see the light going up light going down, you might see the light going left, right, front, back, everywhere it is going except for that bulb holder, we will neglect that. Every direction it is going almost, right? So it is going equal in all the directions. So you will see the wavefront growing in size, which is going to look like a sphere, which is growing in size. So the wavefronts are spherical and those spheres grow in size. Then the next sphere will come and grow in size. Next sphere will come and grow in size. So that is why I am saying they are spherical in nature. They go in all the possible directions. That is a spherical wavefront. Is that clear, my dear students? Absolutely. Very good. Keep this in mind. So that is spherical wavefront, which comes from a spherical source. The next one is cylindrical wavefront. The cylindrical wavefront, think of it to come out. I'll give you an example. A tube light. A tube light. A tube light. Now this tube light is basically a linear source, a linear, linear or I would say cylindrical, linear or basically cylindrical source of light. If you have observed a tube light, it's like a tube, it's like a cylinder. The light does not go in exactly all the directions. It comes, you know, from that curved surface, you can think of it, it comes basically from that curved surface like this, 
it comes from the curved surface like this and the light spreads basically here 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 like this along that curved surface the curved surface keeps on expanding so that is a very good example of a cylindrical source of light where you can think the source is like a line like a cylinder and the cylinder expands in radius only not in height the cylinder expands in radius only not in height so visualize a cylinder becoming bigger 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 only in the radius not in height so that is how a cylindrical wavefront behaves like i hope this is clear very good the last one the example of this you might have seen you might have seen on the roof sometimes maybe in a railway station airport or some mall or maybe in your house or somewhere else you might have seen on the roof they put this uh, you know sheet which is semi transparent and behind that it is illuminated and it feels like the roof only is illuminated it's like a sheet of light which is illuminated from a back so a sheet translucent one translucent illuminated from the back which is illuminated this will this will produce planar wavefronts so imagine there is this sheet which is basically illuminated from the back you will see after some time the wavefront generated from it will come here after some more time the wavefront generated from it will come over here after some more time the wavefront generated from it will come over here so you will see the plane will move there is one plane and that plane keeps on progressing ahead so the direction in which the wave progresses is like this and the wavefronts are basically perpendicular to it and the wavefronts are basically perpendicular to it so that is an example of planar wavefront where the size does not grow of the wavefront but it keeps on propagating perpendicular to the wavefront and you will see that the light energy moves ahead right so this is an example of planar wavefront example was the sheet of translucent uh, illuminated uh, source now remember the term intensity of light how intense the light is how intense the light is is basically how much energy is coming let me put over here yes we had defined intensity even in waves if you remember intensity of a sound wave and all of that same thing intensity 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 of light is nothing but the energy flowing the energy which is flowing per unit per unit time per unit per unit area per unit area so basically the intensity formula will be nothing but how much energy is going per unit time that means i have to divide it with time and also divide it with area but energy by time is also nothing but power so it is nothing but power per unit area it is nothing also but power per unit area can you guys quickly tell me what might be the unit of intensity what might be the unit of intensity my dear students what will be the unit of intensity think about it power by area power is nothing but in watts so it will be nothing but watts per nothing but meter square watts per meter square you can also use joules per second per meter square joules per second per meter square will also do that is perfectly fine also one interesting thing which you should keep in mind is that light is a wave wave has wavelength wavelength frequency amplitude all these things so is intensity related to one of these things yes in fact it is found that the intensity of light is always directly proportional is always directly proportional to what the square of the amplitude is always proportional to the square of the amplitude square of the amplitude of the wave that electric field and magnetic field remember 
there will be light is nothing but an electromagnetic wave light is nothing but an electromagnetic wave so definitely there will be some amplitude so this is nothing but the amplitude of the wave this this thing is nothing but the amplitude of that particular wave. so definitely intensity is directly proportional to the square of the amplitude this is another important relationship which you definitely must know apart from this so that's why i'm highlighting them now if you try to find out the intensity variation for different sources you will see the formula slightly you know adjust itself depending on the uh, shape or the size of that source meaning if you go to say for example a plane wavefront for example a plane wavefront the intensity formula the intensity formula of light you know what it will be nothing but the power of the light bulb upon the area of that area of that uh, bulb or that sheet or that surface and the power of that sheet or that source will be constant like 50 watts 70 watts 30 watts etc and the area is also same neither the area is expanding nor is the power changing so p by a will be constant p by a will be constant karthik concentrated bacha okay so p by a will be constant so intensity won't change intensity won't change so intensity will be constant will be constant and not depend and does not and it basically doesn't depend it doesn't depend on basically what the distance how far you are it's not like the intensity will reduce it does not reduce all right right uh, Armigal, i would say please check out my ncrt class which i had conducted during the board sessions i have done derivations for dipoles etc i have conducted marathons i have discussed summary i think that will be the best uh, way to complete electric charges and you can also search my old glasses okay so that that is something which i would recommend you to do in this short time no if you talk about cylindrical wave right? think of it this way intensity will be power divided by that area but the area is only on the curved surface so it will be nothing but area of the curved surface so what is the curved surface area of a cylinder my dear warriors it is nothing but 2 pi r into h 2 pi r into h so that would be the intensity formula for a cylindrical or a linear source because the energy is only there on this curved area the energy is only there on this curved area it is not there on the flat ones because remember only the cylinder's radius increases height is the same so the energy is flowing in all the horizontal directions think of it it's not there on the top or at the bottom if you talk about a spherical wavefront if you talk about a spherical wavefront the intensity of the light will be given by the power of the bulb or the power of the source divided by the area of basically the sphere because the energy is concentrated on the entire sphere what is the area of a sphere it is 4 pi r square it is nothing but 4 pi r square so this is how the formula changes like i said depending on what type of source or wavefronts are there so in the first one interesting thing to note is that the intensity is inversely proportional to what r square intensity is inversely proportional to r square more the r intensity decreases square proportional for cylindrical you will see intensity is inversely proportional to only r it is not r square and for the last one the best thing is it is basically a constant it is basically a constant it does not change only it is independent it does not depend on the distance it does not depend on the distance very interesting thing yes and that is what i have put it on the table also right here here for your reference you can see this intensity is inversely proportional to r square intensity is inversely proportional to r intensity is constant so i have put it up in a beautiful tabular form point source wavefront is spherical for spherical source uh spherical wavefront sorry cylindrical wavefront by linear source and how it will look like and for a plane it will now be generated by a planar source and you will see large uh, sheets or planes which are parallel to each other 
they become the wavefronts and the perpendicular lines become the rays of light right i have summarized it for all of you okay so i think it's a good time we start looking at some questions based out of this here is a simple question if you have the amplitude of a light from a point source at 5 meters from a point source and it is a then for a distance of 15 meters from the source what do you think will be the amplitude of light b that is the question what do you think the amplitude of the light will be okay so let's try to think about this let's try to think about this see first of all <clears throat> if you look over here the light is basically coming out from a point source so as you go from 5 meters to 15 meters close to far away distance increases intensity will go down because intensity will go down what will happen amplitude will also go down understood so that is the logic behind it and for a point source we all know that intensity is inversely proportional to r square also we know also we know that intensity is directly proportional is basically directly proportional to the amplitude square intensity is inversely proportional to r square intensity is directly proportional to a square so can i say a square is then proportional to proportional to basically 1 by r square i can combine both these results together perfect so taking roots on both sides taking roots on both sides this will become 1 by r and what will this become this will just become a oh amplitude is inversely proportional to r so now think logically what has happened to r what has happened to r r was 5 then it became 15 r was 5 then it became 15 that means 15 is basically making it three times making it three times yes or no so that means if r has become three times r has become three times it is in the denominator so what will happen to the amplitude it will become 1 by 3 times it will become 1 by 3 times so which option should be correct which option should be correct yes it should be nothing but it should be nothing but option a understood my dear warriors just one second what just happened ha yeah i hope it is safe. yeah it should become 1 by 3 times is that clear everybody very good so these kind of questions are very common where they might tell you that you know the distance has changed find a new amplitude find a new intensity so these are standard questions which come on the intensity amplitude and distance calculations everything is based on just these formulas intensity is energy per unit time per unit area which is also power by area second thing is intensity is directly proportional to square of the amplitude these are the only formulas that you will get okay now let's basically go to the next concept in light waves and that is called as hygen principle now see this is long long time back people used to fight just like people fight today also that there is also people used to fight and right those days scientists also used to fight with each other and newton said that light is a particle but people like hygen fresnel then even uh, young these were the people who said light has wave like behavior so that debate continued and now we know that light has both kinds of behavior it has dual personality uh, disorder malini the class will be till 7 o'clock around it has dual personality disorder that means it can behave sometimes like a wave sometimes like a particle the wave behavior actually can be very well understood using the theory of hygen Newton said that light is particle those particles he called them as corpuscles he called them as corpuscles and that is why it was called as corpuscular theory today those par par uh, corpuscles is what we know as photons which was uh, you know given by planck and einstein and they won nobel prize for it okay so the corpuscles which newton gave the name for today we know them as photons hygen called light as a mechanical wave that is crazy that is crazy 
Eisen called light as basically a mechanical wave. To think of light as a mechanical wave seems unrealistic, but those times they did not have too much idea about electromagnetic fields, electromagnetic induction that happened couple of 100-200 years later in Maxwell's era. In basically Maxwell, oh my god. Why is it not in the mark test of more? So that happened in basically Maxwell's era. Is that right? And meanwhile, these people thought light is a mechanical wave and light required medium. He thought the medium was nothing but not seen to you. It was there everywhere around you. And he gave the name of the medium also. He called it the ether. He called it basically ether, not the bike ether which you see and advertisements for electric bike. So, yes. So, according to Hygen, according to Hygen, basically he said that light, light is basically a mechanical wave. Light is a mechanical wave which we know is not true. But it is fair enough to agree to that because it explains a lot of phenomena. And he says medium, medium through which light travels, he called it as ether. Please understand it is not that same ether which you learn in organic chemistry. It is a hypothetical medium. It is a hypothetical medium. Hypothetical medium. It was never to be found. Many See, imagine this scientist told that light travels in a medium called ether. Hundreds of scientists became mad to find this ether. They were not able to find it. Finally, you know, they understood that light is an electromagnetic wave and it can travel in vacuum. So, Pavam, one scientist said one thing and everybody became mad and they started finding and looking for this ether. It is not to be found. He also said that the source of light, that the source of light, the source of light creates a disturbance in the medium. Creates disturbance, disturbance in this medium, in this media, in this media. And basically they propagate they they propagate they propagate their wavefronts they propagate their wavefronts in all the directions they propagate their wavefronts in all the possible directions so that is what according to hygiene theory okay these are some important pointers these are some important pointers so now Based on this particular Hygen's theory and Hygen's principle, Hygen was able to explain quite a few phenomena. See, anybody can say anything. I can say light is a wave. I can say light is a particle. I can say light is a mad person. But somebody has to believe it and also have to explain why I am saying so. So, Hygen was able to explain multiple phenomena. That is why we consider his principle. It was able to explain refraction. It was able to explain reflection. It was able to explain even interference of light and so much more. That is why Hygen's principle is considered to be very, very important in spite of having its own limitations like medium was never to be found and light is not even a mechanical wave. Only because it explained a couple of things. Now, according to Hygen, how you were able to explain these multiple phenomena is using something called as the construction, Hygen's construction, which I have mentioned right over here on this particular slide. Where, imagine a disturbance in the medium creates a wavefront. That wavefront is that locus or the collection of the points where, you know, the disturbance reaches together. If you wait for some more time, you will get the new location of the wavefront. How to get the new location of the wavefront is by treating every point in the medium as a new source. Treating every point in the medium as a new source where the wavefront reaches. Those sources are then called as secondary sources. And those secondary sources create their own new wavefronts in the direction of propagation. And the common tangent drawn to it gives the new location of the new wavefront. All of this might be going over your head, sir. What is all this, sir? Hold on. I will explain this to you with simple diagram. So, we will try to understand what did Hygen exactly mean by this. So, just let's take an example over here. 
Okay. So imagine there is a source of light. I will call it S. So what is this S? This is nothing but your source of light. This source creates a disturbance. This source creates a disturbance. So maybe after certain amount of time, this is that disturbance which has gone in all the possible directions. Okay. This is the disturbance which has gone in all the possible directions. Now, this is basically called as your primary wave front. What is this called? This is called as your primary wave front. Primary wave front. This is how the light will go in all the possible directions. These are the rays of light. This is the ray of light. I want to know how will the new wavefront look like. I want to know how will the new wavefront look like. What you should do is, what you should do is, basically, you take any part of that wavefront. This is your primary wavefront. This is basically your primary wavefront. What you do is, you consider every point on the wavefront as a source of light. This point, this point, this point, this point, this point, this point, these points. All these, all these have to be considered as nothing but sources of light. Just one second. It just happened. One second, guys. One second. I hope you are able to see it now. Yeah. Yeah, this is the first class of wave optics. Yes, Steve Jobs. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, all these dots that I have shown, all these dots that I have shown, these are the points on that primary wavefront. These are basically now called as your secondary sources secondary sources these are called as secondary sources so what will these secondary sources do what will these secondary sources do these secondary sources these secondary sources they will emit secondary wavefronts they will emit secondary wavefronts so this is one wavefront this is one wavefront this is one wavefront and the size of these wavefronts depends on when you are trying to draw them. When you are trying to draw them. So the radius of the radius of these wavefronts, radius of these wavefronts is C into T. What is C? Speed of light. What is T? Time. So if you are drawing the secondary wavefronts after 5 seconds, obviously they would have grown much larger in size. If you are drawing it after 0.1 second, they would be much smaller in size. So after how much time do you want to draw? Accordingly, you will show the radius. Now, all these are called as your secondary wavefronts. They are basically called as your secondary wavefronts. Wavefronts. This is the third step of it. So, let me go step by step. This was step number one. This was step number two. This was step number three. This was step number four. Now, the step number five is the last step. Step number five is the last step. So you had your primary wavefront, you had your secondary sources, you have shown the secondary wavefront, but only consider that part of the wavefront, only consider that part of the wavefront 
which is in the direction of the wave propagation which is in the direction of the wave propagation this is very very important so the wave is propagating like this the ray is going like this so only consider the front part so if you look at the front part it looks like this so that is the reason why i have not shown the remaining half of the wave right and now you all have to draw nothing but a tangent to it you just draw common tangent to it so the common tangent will probably look something like this so the common tangent will probably look something like this so this is the new wave front this is the new wave front this is how you show them this is how you show them yes that's all so the old wave front is in yellow the new wave front has been shown in orange just show those circles and draw a common tangent that's all you will get the new location of the wave front this method you can use it for all the explanations be it a refraction or reflection and even wave fronts from concave convex lenses and even mirrors okay so this is the manner in which you can construct a new wave front if you see over here this is exactly what has been done check this slide out check this slide out i did not deliberately show this to you because i wanted you to understand the process not the whole image you can see this is the original source you can see this is the original primary wave front initial wave front all the points on the primary wave front are behaving like a new source they are called secondary sources new wave fronts or wavelets are being created only in the direction where the light is moving and you draw a common tangent and you get the new wave front if the initial wavefront was a planar one if the initial wavefront was a planar wavefront then after some time the new wavefront that you get is also planar in nature the new wavefront is also planar in nature so the shape gets carried forward you can see the shape gets carried forward after some time always the radius that you show is the speed of light into time because speed into time gives you distance so distance by which the light has moved is speed into time that's why ct that's my ct alike i hope it should not be such a problem even if i am taking the classes over here like this it is just a temporary arrangement obviously i'll be back by this sunday to my studio in bangalore okay because i'm traveling like i said i'm going for all these events pune vizag and hyderabad that's the reason why i'm not in my studio how can you explain reflection of light using huygens principle and you can also explain refraction of light using huygens principle it is very straightforward let me just show this to you in a very simple way because many people learn it in very very complex manner uh, just imagine this as our um, you know um, mirror a reflector okay mirror or a reflector so i'm just showing it in white i'm showing the reflecting or the silvered side m over here and imagine light is incident on it somewhere light is basically incident on it somewhere like this these are the rays of light so this is your incident ray if the rays of light are parallel obviously the wave front will also be parallel to it like this so you will see the wave front keeps on propagating ahead like this these are the planar wave fronts right and this planar wave fronts will keep on moving ahead so this is your planar wave fronts planar wave fronts these are your planar wave fronts which are moving like this this is how the ray of light should be now just imagine Do I duplicate this? Okay, I just hope I have pasted it properly. Yeah. Okay. Now, after some time, those planar wave fronts are going to go ahead, and finally comes the moment when at least a part of it or a point of it is just going to touch a point of it of the wave front is just going to touch. the particular mirror surface just one second why is it pausing okay. 
which place I have gone to now. One second, my dear students. Yeah. Okay. I hope it is visible now. Okay. My bad. I don't know why it is getting disconnected today. Huh. So the wavefront will just reach the mirror. The wavefront will just reach the mirror. A point on that wavefront has just reached the mirror surface and that point I have marked as A. The corresponding point on the planar wavefront which has not yet reached is basically point B. Is basically nothing but point B. I hope till this point everybody is clear about this. Till this point, everybody is clear about this. Okay. Now, what will happen next? So, let me show it on the next slide. I'm just showing all the steps so that you know how we proceeded step by step. How we proceeded step by step. Point A will now act like the secondary source and it will create secondary wavelets, secondary wavefronts. But those wavefronts, mind it, they cannot go here. Why they can't go here? Why they can't go down? Because there is a mirror. It is a reflector. So what will happen? Those secondary wavefronts will grow on this side. They will not grow below because of the reflection which is happening. So you will see after some time, you know, the wavefront would have grown like this. Wavefront would have grown like this at point A. And meanwhile, what you will see, meanwhile, what you will see, this wavefront AB which is there, that wavefront AB would have moved little bit ahead. That wavefront AB would have moved little bit ahead, maybe somewhere over here. Maybe the wavefront would have moved a little bit ahead over here. Some more time, the wavefront at A would have grown more in size, would have grown more in size. That wavefront at AB would have gone even more ahead, would have gone even more ahead like this, right? It would have definitely gone even more ahead like that, right? So it will go maybe till here. After some more time, that wavefront would have grown even more, and maybe the wavefront has gone till here, and finally. Finally, the wavefront would have reached here and probably you will see that large wavefront like this. Probably you will see the large wavefront like this. So you will see that the wavefronts keep on growing in size. So maybe like this. Maybe it will become like this. Just one second. Then finally, it reaches here and you might see a new wavefront like this. This is what you are going to see. This is how it is going to, you know, keep on expanding. But at the same time, do not forget, wherever the wavefront reaches, like for example, this AB wavefront, after some time reached over here, that point which just touched the mirror, that will also act like the secondary wavefront. And you will see a new wavefront will be generated over there at that particular instant. When that wavefront finally reaches here, Right? A new wavefront will be generated and those new new wavefronts will be generated at all the places, at all the places where the wavefront is reaching, at all the places where the wavefront is reaching. So you will see probably after some time, you know, there is a wavefront created here, then there is a wavefront created here, then there is a wavefront created here also and lastly there is also a wavefront created here. So if you actually draw it after a decent amount of time, how will it look? How is it going to look? When that wavefront which is there at point B actually ends up reaching at point C. The wavefront which is at point B that ends up reaching at point C. You will see the secondary source at point A would have grown in decent amount of size. It would have grown in size probably like this. It would have grown in size probably like this, okay, over here. The wavefront which is just created at C will be very small in size. There will be more such wavefronts out here, but they will be of different, different sizes. They will be of different, different sizes, something like this, something like this.
something like this. See, if you are able to visualize this, everybody with me, don't consider the bottom part. Don't consider the bottom part. Only consider the top. Now, once you get these new wavefronts, uh, the one at A was the oldest one. The one near C is the newest one. That is why it is small in size. So, if you draw a common tangent to all of them, if you draw a common tangent to all of them, what you get is the new wavefront. You just have to draw basically a common tangent to all of them. So, this will be basically your reflected wavefront. This will be basically your reflected wavefront. And that reflected wavefront undoubtedly will go like this. Reflected wavefront will undoubtedly go like this. Is that absolutely clear? Everybody with me? Understood? How the reflected wavefront is going to go? I've just drawn the common tangent and just show the perpendicular. Those will give you the reflected waves. Perfect. Same way you can also explain refraction. Same way you can also explain refraction, my dear warriors. Something like this. Again, imagine boundary interface. On the top, you have medium one. On the top, you have medium number one. And at the bottom, you have medium number two. So imagine incident light falling like this. Incident light falling on the interface, let's say like this. Let's say like this. So the first point of that wavefront to touch will be point A. Meanwhile, the other side will be at point B. Now what you will see is secondary wavefronts are created, but because the light can continue its journey in the medium number two, it can continue its journey in the medium number two. So you will see the point A, which acts like the new source, will keep on creating wavefronts like this. It will keep on growing in size. Meanwhile, as the wavefront progresses ahead, ahead, ahead like this, you will see new, new points will act like the secondary sources over here. New, new points will act like the secondary sources over here. They too will create their own wavefronts. They too will create their own wavefronts. But A is the oldest one. Remember that A is the oldest one. So the A's wavefronts will be the largest in size. The other wavefronts will be little bit smaller. The other wavefronts will be little bit smaller. So after all of that entire wavefront has completely gone over here to this particular point C, you will see that this is how it will look like probably. One second. Probably it will look something like this. One second. This is how it will look like. Ignore the part which is there at the back because that part is not where the light will go. That part is not where the light will go. Now you just draw a common tangent to all of them. Draw a common tangent to all of them. This is your new secondary wavefront. You draw a perpendicular to it. You draw a perpendicular to it. That will give you the new direction of light propagation. But that is not reflected. This is refracted. And that is how you can see the light rays have bent using Huygens theory. Using Huygens theory, you can see that the light rays have actually ended up bending. Understood? So, uh, if you want to exactly prove Snell's law and all of that, I have done that in the derivations class. Uh, just few days back, I had uploaded a beautiful lecture. It's a big lecture of all the derivations. Over there also, you can see the same derivation which I have done. All right? Now, uh, what kind of questions come in the examination that is very important. See, there was one question which has come, you know, in multiple uh, papers in competitive exams, be it NEET or even J. Imagine there is a convex lens. How will the wavefront look like when the rays converge? So, imagine the rays of light which are parallel, right? After passing through the lens, what will happen? The rays will begin to converge at the focal point. So, to show the new wavefront, all you need to do is Draw a perpendicular to the ray of light. Draw a perpendicular to the ray of light. You will see that the wavefront will look basically like this. The wavefront will look like this. So the new wavefronts will essentially look something like this. These are the wavefronts of light after refraction from a convex lens. Is that clear? Same way, if a question comes, how will the wavefronts look like 
when they pass from a concave lens from a concave lens because the rays will diverge you show the diverging rays and just drop a perpendicular because wavefronts are always perpendicular to the rays so the new wavefronts will look like this bulged out they are bulging out and they will keep on growing in size so they'll keep on growing in size like this so these will be the new wavefronts from a concave lens which are diverging in nature similarly you can get a question from mirror also say for example it's a concave mirror the rays of light are parallel after reflection the rays will converge at the focus for a concave mirror so my dear students over here i hope you are able to see these wavefronts i hope you are able to see these wavefronts right these are the wavefronts which have been drawn by showing perpendicular to the rays always show the rays once you know the rays right immediately you can understand how the uh, wavefronts are going to look like how the wavefronts are going to look like perfect you can also draw for a prism till now a question on prism hasn't come but if it comes this is how the wavefront will look like a parallel beam of light passes through the prism you can see you will get a diverging beam of uh, wavefront right over here you will see that the rays will bend remember when light passes through a prism they refract they deviate so you will see some deviation occurring over here you will see definitely some deviation occurring over here so this will be the new wavefront which will be formed this will be the new wavefront which will be formed over here right so this is for a prism for a mirror for a lens everything i have just shown them to you okay now simple question which is there in exercise of your ncert light of certain wavelength is incident from air on water surface what are the wavelength frequency and speed of light when it is reflected refracted refractive index is so and so here you know this is not a complex problem at all because it is just based on simple wave formulas like speed of light is nothing but f into lambda speed of light is nothing but f into lambda i think the wavelength is given wavelength is given as 589 nano means 10 to the power minus 9 meters speed of light is a standard value which is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second substituting everything you will get frequency is c by lambda and you will get the value of frequency everybody till this point okay now frequency of light never changes remember that whether it is reflected or refracted so this frequency is same is same for either when you take reflected or even refracted that doesn't change frequency of the light is only dependent on the source as long it is coming from the same light source frequency will be unaffected what changes is only the wavelength or the speed so for that you will have to use snell's law over here and say that listen the speed of light in air upon the speed of light in that particular water is nothing but the refractive index and speed of light is frequency into wavelength frequency into wavelength frequency frequency will cancel so from this you can find the speed of light in water or even the wavelength of light in water speed of light in water will be speed of light in air divided by mu that means 3 into 10 to the power 8 divided by mu mu is nothing but uh, how much is it 1.33 1.33 and if you talk about the wavelength of light in water that will be nothing but wavelength of light in air divided by mu wavelength of light in water if you take it on the top mu will come below mu will come basically come below right so that's it so just divide them you will get the answer so it was 589 nanometer divided with divided with basically 1.33 that's all yeah so in lens we get spherical wavefronts yes sanvi you can you will get spherical wavefronts because if the surface is spherical you will also get spherical wavefronts yes for a lens the same thing has been done it is not a big problem at all it is a very straightforward looking problem okay now uh let's go to the next part and that is basically where we come to interference of light and there we come to young's double slit experiment and uh, you know the different cases of it okay now this is the main part of the chapter and it all starts with a theory called as coherent source versus incoherent source now what is the meaning of coherent and what is the meaning of incoherent source 
best thing is to look at this example right over here on your screen. See over here. One is the light which comes out from a bulb, your regular bulb, which you have at homes. And other is the laser light. See the difference between these two wavelengths, between these two waves. In coherent, do you see that if, if light is coming out of that laser and there is a crest, then every point, everywhere, you will see crests coming together. The entire laser is generating crests together and the entire laser is generating troughs, crests, trough, crests together. There is a sink between them. There is a, you know, I would say there is a nice uh, synchronization between them. They know what they are doing. They know that they are in rhythm. They know that they are in the same situation. They know that they are in the same phase. Phase means situation. But in case of your normal light bulb, tube light, etc., one is generating crest, one is generating trough, one might be generating high frequency, low frequency. Sometimes it is not generating at all. So all these problems might happen. So basically they are not in the same sync. They are out of sync. Out of sync, so they are incoherent. They are not making sense to me. They are random. They are not in rhythm. They are incoherent. That is the main meaning of incoherence. They are not in phase. So, the source which emits light waves of the same frequency, same wavelength and same phase and maintains that phase is called as a coherent source. It is basically called as a coherent source. Same wavelength, same frequency, same phase. That is called as coherent. Example is the laser light. But incoherent source, the example will be, you know, your normal light bulb, etc., they produce incoherent light sources uh, and incoherent waves where you might have different frequency or different wavelength or different situations, different phase. Phase is not constant. That is said to be incoherent. Now, if that is the case, is only laser the option for creating coherent light? Is laser the only option to create coherent light? The answer is no. The answer is no. You can create coherent light even using an incoherent source of light. Yes, what am I saying? Even with an incoherent light bulb source, say I have a source of light. This might generate incoherent light waves. Even then, I can make it coherent. How? Here is the logic behind it. All you need to do is, all you need to do is ensure, see, let me just put it like this. If I take bulb number 1 and bulb number 2, 100%, 100%, whatever waves which will come out of it, they will be incoherent incoherent basically i would say independent independent sources independent sources will always be incoherent but if you make them dependent if you make them dependent they will be coherent and how to make them dependent you take one single source you take a cardboard piece or an opaque material and in that you make two holes or more holes in it. Two or more holes in it or slits in it, gaps in it. You will see that this source will create wavefronts. This source will create the wavefronts and those wavefronts will reach these slits. Maybe together, maybe not together, that is not the point. They might not even reach together, that's okay. But the thing which happens after this is both these slits, this is your slit number one, this is your slit number one, and this is your slit number two. These slits are going to be acting like a secondary source, Hygen's principle. They are going to act like a secondary source and they will generate secondary wavefronts which are completely in sync with the original source. They are in complete rhythm with the original source. 
complete rhythm with the original source. So you might see the wave fronts coming out of it like this. You might see the wave fronts which are coming out of it like this. Wave fronts coming out of it like this. Yes, uh, just one second. Why did it again stop? Oh, the Wi-Fi is going again and again. That is the reason. Is it seen? Yeah, it is seen. Yeah. So you will get the secondary Wavefronts, these secondary wavefronts. Now, because these slits are dependent on what light the primary source is emitting, these dependent dependent sources are always going to be coherent in nature coherent in nature. This is very, very important. The moment they are two separate light bulbs, they are incoherent. The moment they are dependent on each other, because only when the bulb 1 S is on, only then slit 1 and slit 2 will be illuminated. Otherwise, they will not be illuminated. Only then you will see that both the sources, both the slits will act like secondary sources and they will be emitting new light. So they are dependent on S. So those dependent slits sources are always going to be coherent in nature. That is something which you should keep in mind. That is something which you should keep in mind. Okay. Now, in order to study interference, you will have interference even with incoherent light. You will also have interference of light with coherent light. Now, what is the meaning of interference? Interference is when multiple light bulbs, multiple light sources emitting their own wavefronts meet at each other. When they meet, they will add their effects and you get a resultant wave. And this is what I have told you in simple harmonic motion also in sound waves and waves on a string. When two or more waves meet, they will interfere either constructively, destructively or maybe something else only. And you will see a new resultant wave which is being formed. So, interference is that phenomena where light waves of different light Bulbs or light sources, they meet at a point and they generate a resultant. You can have interference with incoherent as well as coherent sources. If by chance the light sources are incoherent for incoherent for incoherent sources of light. Having intensities, having intensities, let's say I1 and I2 interfere, interfere to produce the resultant wave, produce the resultant, produce the resultant wave of intensity intensity i then then it so happens that this intensity is simply put the addition of the intensities of the individual light bulbs or the individual light sources that's all i1 plus i2 is basically total i if they are what incoherent in nature this word is very important they are incoherent they are incoherent then the intensities will add but if they are coherent in nature they are coherent in nature then you can get all sorts of interferences like constructive or destructive just the example of this look at this for constructive the crest meets with crest and you get a big wave for destructive, remember this crest meets with trough, they nullify each other, all those sorts of interference. So, for, for, for coherent, 
for coherent sources for coherent sources having i1 and i2 intensities having i1 and i2 intensities interfere interfere to produce light of resultant resultant intensity i so if they are coherent then the formula is slightly different what is the formula the intensity formula is given by i1 i1 plus i2 plus 2 root i1 i2 cos delta phi try to recollect what is delta phi delta phi is nothing but the phase difference which is given by 2 pi by lambda into delta x this is phase difference this is phase difference delta x is path difference path difference try to recollect if you have a wave like this if you have a wave like this maybe the other wave might be just till here so there is a difference in length between their arrival they arrive at two different times so the difference in their length of the path is called as the path difference that gives to phase difference with delta phi and then the resultant intensity is i1 plus i2 plus 2 root i1 i2 cos the delta this is the formula for coherent sources you can see it is very different from incoherent sources in incoherent sources that root i1 i2 is not there only i1 plus i2 is there so for coherent that 2 root i1 i2 cos delta phi is there that's the major difference and to find the phase difference use the part difference for this one you can also find the resultant amplitude remember the resultant amplitude is nothing but given by you have to take the root of this you have to take the root of this if you remember it was a1 square plus a2 square plus 2a1 a2 cos delta phi all you had to do is use vector addition formula vector addition formula if you recollect this is addition of vectors formula and i had told you that you can add the amplitudes like vectors you can add the amplitudes just like vectors if one wave has an amplitude a1 and the other wave has an amplitude a2 both their amplitudes are shown like vectors and the angle between them is basically your delta phi then the resultant will be given by triangle polygon parallelogram whichever law you want you will get the resultant amplitude you will get the resultant amplitude that is a so use vector addition use basically vector addition of the phasers of the phasers of the waves of the phasers of the waves right so this is something which i told you in the waves chapter if you have forgotten if you have missed the class please watch that as well. and you also get the condition for constructive and destructive interference let me just remind you of that formulas again so if you are talking about constructive interference my dear warriors if you are talking about constructive interference the resultant amplitude which you get is maximum and it is simply given by a1 plus a2 the intensity of light that you get is also maximum it is given by root i1 plus root i2 whole square the phase difference between the waves can be either 0 2 pi 4 pi in general it can be any even number of pi and the path difference can be either 0 lambda 2 lambda in general it can be any n lambda right and the waves are said to be in the phase the waves are said to be in the phase when you talk about destructive interference the amplitude when you talk about destructive interference the amplitude is the least and it will be the bigger amplitude 
minus the smaller amplitude. The intensity of the light which is produced is also very low. It will be a root of I1 minus root of I2 whole square. Correct? The phase difference, remember, is either pi, 3 pi, all of that. 3 pi, pi, 5 pi. What are these numbers? These are basically odd multiples of pi. In fact, even the path difference will be lambda by 2, 3 times lambda by 2, 5 times lambda by 2, like that. In general, odd times, odd times lambda by 2, odd times lambda by 2. And they are said to be out of phase, out of phase, right? These are the important things regarding constructive and destructive interference. We have studied this even in the waves chapter, even in the waves chapter, right? So keep all these pointers in mind, okay? This is more like revision what we did of uh, sound waves and waves on a string interference, okay? So let's do some questions based out of it. Which statement is true for interference? Which statement is basically true for interference? That is the question. Two independent source of light can produce interference pattern. There is no violation of conservation of energy. Li white light can't produce interference. Interference pattern can be only obtained even if coherent sources are wide apart. What do you think is true for interference? Well, the correct answer for this is there is no violation of conservation of energy. Basically, a lot of people think, sir, two waves come and they will interfere destructively. Where will the energy go? My answer to that is, yes, they interfere, they interfere destructively. The energy will not be there at that place. But some other place will have constructive interference. There the energy will be more. So, don't think that energy get destroyed in destructive interference. That energy is going to shift to a new location where constructive interference happens. So, energy violation will not happen. That is always true throughout the universe, undoubtedly. And independent sources, when they produce interference pattern, it is not sustained because, you know, one is producing something, one is not producing something. So, there is no fixed interference pattern that you can get. White light will also not produce interference because white light is made of not one wavelength, but multiple colors. So, all these multiple colors, when they interfere, there will not be a clear interference pattern that you will see. And you will see later on why D option is wrong. Because when the sources are very far away, the distance is much, much larger than the wavelength of light. So, the pattern that you will see on the screen will be invisible to the naked eye. Okay. So, and it will hardly be seen. So, when the distances are large as compared to the wavelength, then generally you do not see those interference patterns. That is the reason for it. Okay. Let's take up another example. Amplitude of interfering waves are basically in the ratio of 2 is to 5. The ratio of the maximum to minimum intensity of the waves is. Thank you, Krishna. Glad you love the notes. Yes. I think on iPad, the notes come out very beautifully uh, than the big screen. But yeah, the feeling is very different on this setup. So, if the amplitudes of the waves are given 2 is to 5, then the ratio of maximum and minimum intensity are. First of all, can I find A max by A minimum? Yes, I can. A max by A minimum will be if one of the waves has an amplitude of 2, another waves has amplitude of 5, maximum amplitude will be 2 plus 5. Minimum amplitude will be 5 minus 2, big minus large, a uh, big minus small. 2 plus 5 is 7, 5 minus 2 is basically 3. So, maximum amplitude by minimum amplitude is 7 is to 3. But that is not the answer because the question says intensity. We know intensity is directly proportional to the amplitudes square. So, the maximum intensity by the minimum intensity, won't it be A max by A minimum whole square? So, won't it be 7 by 3 whole square, which is nothing but 49 by 9, which is nothing but 49 by 9. That is the answer, which is option B. Yes, B for Banerjee. Correct. Next question coming up on your screen. Two waves are there. They are represented by the following equations. What is the ratio of I max by I minimum? This problem is very much similar to this question. 
just that over here instead of giving you the amplitudes directly they have given the wave equation notice over here in these equations in these two equations this 5 is basically amplitude 1 and this 10 is basically your amplitude number 2 it's now exactly just like the previous problem these other things 10 t point 1 all these things are not even needed by me so do the same thing a max by a minimum will be amplitude 1 plus amplitude 2 and amplitude big minus small amplitude so this will be 15 by 5 which is basically 5 by divided by 5 you will get 3 sorry this will be 3 by 1 so i max by i minimum because it will be square proportional it will be a max by a minimum whole square so it will be 3 by 1 whole square which is 9 is to 1 which is again going to give you b for batch yes b for batch is that clear so it is just like the previous question just that it has been framed written in a different form that's all next now that you understand how intensity amplitudes constructive destructive interference works now is the good time where we learn about the main part where you learn about young's double slit experiment right so let's do this young's double slit experiment what is this young's double slit experiment you will see in this particular setup you have a source of light a source of light which has been illuminated by some bulb okay and those wavefronts go and fall those wavefronts go and fall and illuminate two new slits two new slits over here s1 and s2 these two slits will act like secondary source but dependent on s source s1 is dependent on s s2 is also dependent on s so they are coherent in nature their secondary wavefronts will now go and interfere will now go and interfere some places constructively some places destructively and what you get is an interference pattern and because this is light you have to see it so you use a screen to observe what is the pattern that you get of interference and the pattern that you get is a fringe pattern meaning you see a region which is bright and suddenly a region which is dark. Again, bright region and dark region, you see as if somebody has pasted bright and dark, bright and dark pattern on the screen. That is the fringe pattern that you get using this setup because there are two slits. That's why double slit. This was conducted by Young. That's why Young's double slit experiment. And in short form, you put it as YDSE. Young's double slit experiment and no better way to see Young's double slit experiment than actually feel it than actually feel it so I'm going to show you Young's double slit experiment right over here right over here just look at this in wave interference in this FET simulation okay this is going to be very very interesting observe this so let's study this interference but I wanted it for light so light yeah look at this you can see two sources of light are there over here two sources of uh, light are there can i change the distance between them one second hmm. see I will turn on the light. See how the light goes. It is passing through a single slit. See how the light spreads. See how the light spreads because the slit will act like a secondary source. It will emit secondary wavefronts. Is that right? Oh. But I don't want to do single slit. I want to keep it double slit. So I am going to make it as two slits. If there is no barrier over here, then the light would have just continued. The light would have just continued its journey. There would be nothing over there. There would not be stopped. Now let's put two slits. Look at this. Let's put two slits over here. So as soon as the wavefronts reach, you will see that they spread in both the directions and you can see that they are interfering with each other. Are you able to see that, my dear students? Are you able to see that, my dear students? Yes. Very good. Perfect. 
So let's continue the simulation. And now there is a nice pattern that I see, but still I'm not getting the complete visualization because I don't know whether it is dark or whether it is bright. So how about placing a screen somewhere in the front? Oh, now look at it. I have put a screen in the front. I hope you are able to see it. And now you can see exactly at the midpoint between the two slits in the front, you can see there is a bright region, then a dark region, then a bright region, then a dark region and a bright region. This is your bright, dark, bright, dark interference pattern which is created. I can use different colors also. Let's say I use red color. Let's say I use red color. How is the interference pattern going to look like? Oh, it looks like this. Look at it. It looks like this. If I use right of violetish color, it will look like this. Violet color has a smaller wavelength. You can see the wavelength is smaller. So you can see the fringes are also close by. Do you see the bright and dark fringes have come little bit closer because the wavelength is less. If you did not, if you miss that part or if you miss seeing it, I'll again show it to you. Note in your mind mentally when blue light is used, the fringes are really close. Let's say I make it red, the wavelength is slightly more. You will see the fringes have become wider and they are a little bit far away from each other. Slightly, the difference is very minimal, but it is there. But it is definitely there. Are you able to see that? Yes. Amazing, right? Okay. Not just that. Not just that. I can also change the amplitude. If I change the amplitude, that means the intensity of the light will reduce. You can see on the screen also it became dim. Oh, see, it is so dim, hardly seen. I make the amplitude little bit more. It will become slightly more. It is slightly bright, bright, dark. I make the amplitude even more, more bright and dark. And then when I increase the amplitude the highest, then you will see it more bright, more bright. Not just that, you will also see if, let me basically create the slit width. Ha. If I change the slit separation, meaning if I keep the slits far away from each other, the interference happens at different location. See the interference is happening at different location. You can see that. Yeah. If I bring the slits close, you can see the interference is happening at a completely different location. Right? I hope you are able to see that. The interference is happening at a completely different location. So changing the slit separation also changes how wide these fringes are or how quickly you are seeing these bright and dark fringes. You can see now they have come close. You can also change the distance between the slit and the screen. I brought the slits very close. Oh, see the pattern. You can see more bright and dark fringes. Yeah. If I move it very far, then the fringes will be very far away from each other. The fringes will be very far away from each other. So you can see uh, hardly any fringes on the screen. Hardly any fringes on the screen, right? So when you bring it close, then you can see more and more fringes. So basically everything matters. The wavelength matters. The distance between the slits matter. The distance between the slits and the screen also matters. All these things together play an important role in the interference pattern which is produced on the screen. On the interference pattern which is basically produced on the screen. Is that right? Everybody with me? Clear? Okay. So, we want to get to the uh, final formulas now. The derivation part, I had done it uh, even before. Still, I can just do it for you slightly over here. Just one second. So when we talk about YDAC setup, uh, certain terms which you should definitely know is this one. The distance between the slits and the screen is called capital D. From the screen to the slits is usually called capital D. Keep this in mind. Yeah. Then the distance between the slits themselves the distance between the slits themselves is called small d, small d, okay. This point O is the center of the screen. This is the center of the screen. The 
light bulb which is there it will emit wavelength of wavelength lambda and generally you show a perpendicular line from the midpoint of the slits to the center of the screen and you might be considering any point on the screen you might be considering any point on the screen that is point p it will be making certain angle with that yellow line the central line so the angle over here is represented as theta this distance op this distance o to point p where you are considering is y the y coordinate of that point okay all these are pretty much standard all these are pretty much standard you can also see that tan of theta will be opposite side by adjacent which is basically capital opposite side which is basically y divided by adjacent side which is the base over here which is capital d these are standard things okay keep all these things in mind these are used so if you consider that particular point p on the screen and the light is coming from two different slits like this light is coming from two different slits like this slit number one and slit number two the separation between them is obviously d the separation between them is obviously d like this you can see the waves from s1 and s2 are not arriving together one is coming faster two is coming slower one is coming faster two is coming slower later on so there is a path difference which is created so definitely there is a path difference which is created path difference which is going to be created that path difference delta x is always the larger minus the smaller in this case it is s2p and s1p is smaller but it could have been the other way around if you are below imagine point p was here s1 will be more s2 will be small so i have taken mod value that means always take the mod value that is a positive value and this value this value delta x which is the difference of the path length comes out as approximately approximately small d sin theta i hope you remember and recollect what theta was i hope you remember what theta was right theta was the angular position theta is also called as the angular position angular position angular position of that point which you have considered and that comes out as d sin theta this is one of the most important relationships this is one of the most important relationships keep this in mind okay everybody with me awesome now that you know delta x is d sin theta if theta is small if theta is small which is usually the case is usually the case then you will see that instead of sin theta i can also put tan theta but we know what tan theta is tan theta is nothing but y by d tan theta is nothing but y by d so i can just put it as dy by capital d is basically delta x dy by capital d is basically delta x is that absolutely clear everyone with me on this okay and when is this result valid this result is only valid and i use this approximation symbol only because this capital d the distance between the screen and the slits is much larger than the distance between the slits themselves only then you can use this so this is the formula which comes up for the path difference or the path difference between the light waves which are falling on the screen which are falling on the screen keep this in mind now when you proceed ahead and you try to figure out when will there be constructive interference when will there be destructive interference so when there is a constructive interference happening you will get maximum intensity of light maximum intensity of light and there you will get a bright region you will get a bright region and we have already second why is it not seen
हाँ एंड वी हैव ऑलरेडी सीन द कंडीशन फॉर ब्राइट रीजन और मैक्सिमम इंटेंसिटी और कंस्ट्रक्टिव इंटरफेरेंस इज बेसिकली डेल्टा एक्स शुड बी एन टाइम्स लैमडा बट वेट अ मिनट डेल्टा एक्स इज डी वाई बाई डी डेल्टा एक्स इज डी वाई बाई डी सो डी वाई बाय कैपिटल डी इज एन टाइम्स ऑफ लैमडा सो द वाई कोऑर्डिनेट विल बी एन टाइम्स ऑफ Lambda capital D by small d. These are the locations where you get bright fringes. Where you get basically bright fringes. Keep this in mind. Okay. So y is equal to n lambda capital D by small d. This y coordinate is the location of the places where you get bright fringes, maximum light, constructive interference. Same thing you can also do for destructive interference. same thing you can also do for destructive interference there you will have minimum light minimum light intensity also called as minimas here is the region of darkness or dark fringes and those dark fringes i can say will be having a condition delta x is equal to odd times lambda by 2 remember destructive interference it is odd wavelength by 2 But delta x we know is d y by capital D. We got it from here only, d y by capital D. So this will become odd times of lambda by two. So the y coordinate will be odd times lambda capital D by small d and divide this by two. These are the locations where you get dark regions, minimum light, destructive interference. Okay, straightforward, my dear students. Easy peasy. Okay. now because you get constructive then destructive constructive then destructive constructive then destructive you will get a fringe pattern you will get a fringe pattern like this you will get a fringe pattern like this so let me just show it on the next slide maybe this is your screen Just one second. Okay, this is your screen, and let's say, for example, this is the origin point on the screen. This is the origin point on the screen. At the origin, you will see. You will always get a maxima. you will always get a bright region there will be constructive interference reason for that is because if you observe it carefully over here the light from s1 light from s2 both of them come simultaneously so if the crest is generated from s1 crest is also generated from s2 both the crests arrive together that is the reason why you will get in sync motion or constructive interference they are in phase and you will get a bright region over there so always you will see at the origin you will see a maxima so i will also call it as the central maxima this is also called as the central or sometimes even zeroth maxima zeroth maxima then after that you will get a region of darkness you can see very minimal light and again a bright region over here so this is your first maxima and then the next maxima will be called second maxima second maxima and the same thing continues forever on the top as well as below so at the bottom also you will see first maxima first maxima then you will also have second maxima i'm not shown it over here but it is there and this journey will continue like this on the top also and at the bottom also is that right correct now in between them what you get are the minima locations so between the central and the first maxima you will get the first minima you will get the first minima over here then you will get the second 
minima over here and so on and so forth. Here also you will get first minima. Then here you will get second minima in between them. And after second maxima, you will get third minima and so on and so forth. So on and so forth. So this is alternating in nature. It is alternating in nature. Yes, Velo, you will be getting the PDF later on. You will be getting the PDF later on. So, what I calculated over here is the Y coordinate of what are their locations on the screen. What are their locations on, of the screen, right? So, these are the Y coordinates of the bright or the dark regions on the screen. Yeah. Are the fringes finite? Yes. They are countable in nature. They are not infinite. I'll come to that also in a bit. Hold on. Now, if you measure the distance from one bright region to the next bright region or let's say from one dark region to the next dark region minima to minima that distance is called as the fringe width what is it called it is called as the fringe width and the for, uh, formula for fringe width is as follows the distance is the same fringe width beta is simply put Lambda capital D by small d. Lambda capital D by small d. This is the formula for the fringe width. Wavelength into D by small d. Now you might be thinking, sir, are there infinite fringes over here? We'll come to that. See, there can't be infinite fringes. I'll tell you why. Imagine, imagine the distance between the two sources or the slits. Example is uh, 3 lambda, 3 times the wavelength. I am just taking a random example. And this is your screen. This is your screen. Okay, this is your screen. What will happen is, at the center, at the exact center, on the center point of the screen, both the light waves will arrive simultaneously. So, don't you see, the path difference between them will be 0. In fact, even the angle will be 0 degree. In fact, even the angle will also be 0 degree. So, path difference will also be 0. Now, imagine you slowly start going up over here. One wave has to travel more than the other. One wave has to travel more than the other. So, definitely there will be a path difference which is created and you will see that delta x increases. Delta x increases as we go on the top. As we go on the top. Now, you keep going far away, far away, far away like that and you reach infinity. So, how will the rays or how will the interference look like? I mean, from slit 1, from slit 1, one ray will go like this, almost parallel to the screen and the other ray will be going almost like this. Other ray will be going like this. Just visualize this over here. Because they are going to meet at infinity, something like that. Something like that are going at infinity so they will go almost parallel to the screen parallel to the screen and they will meet at infinity they will meet at infinity once they meet at infinity what is the difference of their paths what is the difference of their paths think about it one wave is ahead of the other wave by exactly this distance which is the distance between the slits so can i say delta x will be close to, will be close to 3 times of lambda, will be close to 3 times of lambda. Think about it. When they go to infinity, one ray is going like this. Other ray will be going like this. So, one wave will be behind the other wave. One wave will be other behind the other wave by distance of 3 lambda as they reach infinity. Make sense? Oh. So, on the origin, part difference is 0. At infinity, the part difference is 3 lambda. So, what other part differences will you get on the way? You will definitely get delta x is equal to 1 lambda. You will also get delta x is equal to 2 lambda. But you will never exactly get 3 lambda. You will never exactly get 3 lambda. So, now this much information is enough to predict how many bright fringes are there and how many dark fringes are there. So, for bright fringes, think about it. 0 lambda, lambda and 2 lambda. Basically, n lambda is what creates constructive or bright regions. n lambda is what creates constructive or bright regions. So, you have 0, you have lambda, 
you have two lambda on the other side also minus lambda and minus two lambda on the other side so totally basically you have five bright fringes five by bright fringes is what i can say five fringes five fringes is that making sense to all of you five bright fringes two on the top two below and the central one is the fifth one similarly if you talk about the dark fringes similarly if you talk about the dark fringes see in between them whatever comes is minimas so there will be one minima here one minima here and one minima over here there will be same thing on the top same uh, same thing on the top and same thing below so one minima here one minima here and one minima here so totally three on the top three below three on the top three and three will make it basically six fringes six fringes together six fringes together if you are wondering what will be their part difference sir it will be 0 0.5 lambda then it will be 1.5 lambda and it will be 2.5 lambda both plus minus both plus minus both plus minus remember lambda by 2 odd multiple is going to give you dark fringes so lambda by 2 is 0.5 3 lambda by 2 is 1.5 5 lambda by 2 is 2.5 so plus minus 0 0.5 lambda 1.5 lambda 2.5 lambda top bottom will give you six dark fringes that's how you count the number of fringes which is generated in a young's double slit experiment okay i hope this is clear you have done this condition for bright and dark fringes also fringe width and also angular fringe width also comes uh, as a question sometimes so if a question comes on angular fringe width what you need to understand is okay this is the fringe width how much angle does it subtend how much angle does it subtend okay how much angle does it subtend so delta theta that is your angular fringe width angular fringe width angular fringe width because this distance will be capital d approximately from the screen to the slits almost it will be d can i not say that using the length of the arc formula which is radius multiplied by the angle over here the length of the arc is beta think of this like an arc this is a sector of a circle radius is basically like d angular width is the angle so beta is nothing but lambda d by small d is d into delta theta d into delta theta so therefore your delta theta will be nothing but lambda by small d that is the formula for your angular width for your angular width lambda by t is that clear my dear students how you got angular fringe width right you can treat this like a small circles sector okay and uh, this is like your arc this is like your radius and this is the angle subtended that's all that is the answer for it great okay so all this is done and i have given some theory pointers also for all of you okay so what kind of questions are there in ydsc setup the slits are separated by some meters millimeters screen is placed at certain distance from the uh, uh, from the slits distance between the central fringe and the fourth bright fringe is measured to be 1.2 determine the wavelength of the light used in this experiment so let's understand what and all is given to me they are separated by 0.28 millimeters this means small d distance between the slits is 0.28 into 10 to the power minus 3 meters the screen is placed 1.4 meters away means capital d is 1.4 meters now what is given is the distance between central maxima and the fourth fringe that means the y position of the fourth maxima is given to be 1.2 centimeters so 1.2 into 10 to the power minus 2 meters question is what is the wavelength the best way to do this question is remembering the formula for maxima and the formula for maxima or location on a screen is given by y is equal to n times lambda capital d by small d so lambda would be nothing but y small d divided by 
N capital D. That's all. So now you just have to substitute everything. The Y coordinate is given 1.2 into 10 to the power minus 2. Small d is also given 0.28 into 10 to the power minus 3. And N is also given. It is the fourth bright fringe. And capital D is also given. It is 1.4. Solving this, you will get the value of lambda. That's all. This is your NCRT question. The wavelength comes out to be 600 nanometers, like you can see over here. Same calculation has been done as we expected. So it comes out to be 600 into 10 to the power minus 9 meters. It is 600 nanometers. If you know the formula, it is becoming easier. And NCRT questions definitely do come. Moving ahead to the next one. In YDSC, if you use monochromatic light of wavelength I, sorry, wavelength, I think something L, the intensity of a light at a point on the screen where part difference is lambda is K units. What is the intensity of light at a point where part difference is L by 3? Interesting. There are two situations over here. I think it is L only over here or lambda. Okay. Fine. I think the symbol did not get printed properly. It is supposed to be lambda. So light's wavelength is lambda and where part difference is lambda, the resultant intensity is supposed to be K units. So let's understand the first piece of information. Delta X is lambda. Resultant intensity is basically K. And when delta X is lambda, it is definitely a constructive interference. It is definitely a constructive interference. Remember this logic. Part difference is lambda, 2 lambda, 3 lambda, n lambda. It is constructive interference. That means the phase difference between them, you can take it 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, doesn't matter. You can take it any multiple of, uh, uh, you know, even multiple of pi. Okay. So therefore, using the intensity formula, which is given by I1 plus I2 plus 2 root I1 I2 into cos delta phi, which is cos 0. Resultant intensity is K. I, I can take out common. It will become 1 plus 1 plus cos 0 is 1. Root of I square will become I, which I have taken common, plus 2. So I think it will just become 4I. So K will become 4I. Just check this out. K will become 4i. Till this point, everything is clear. I've just used the first piece of information. I have not even touched the second piece. What is the intensity of light where the part difference is lambda by 3? Now comes the second part. Delta x is lambda by 3. It is not constructive. It is not even destructive. Let me tell you that. So what is the phase difference going to be? Use this formula. 2 pi by lambda into delta x. So it will become 2 pi divided by lambda. Delta x is lambda by 3. Lambda lambda cancels. It will become 2 pi by 3, which is 120 degrees. Oh, so this is the phase difference between them. I can find the resultant intensity. So the resultant intensity will be I1 plus I2 plus 2 root I1 I2, which is root I I only two times, into cos 120 degrees. This will be I common 1 plus 1 plus 2. What is cos of 120 degrees, my dear students? What is going to be cos of 120 degrees? Just think about it. Won't it be minus half? Won't it be minus half? So 1 plus 1 minus 1. So it will just become I. Oh, so the resultant intensity is I. But wait a minute. 4I is equal to K. So basically, since 4I is equal to K, so I will be K by 4. I will be k by 4. So just put this as k by 4. So that should be the resultant intensity. That is what is the final answer. That is what is the final answer. You don't need any other intensity formulas. This is the main formula. This is the general formula. In NCRT, what they have done, they have given some formula of 4i cos square 5 by 2 and all that. But remember, that formula will not work every time, especially if the intensities are different. So that is the reason why you use my formula where you can use it any place, any location. It will work every time. So don't remember that NCRT 4i cos square 5 by 2. This is given. Okay. Yes. Some 
formula is given. Sometimes some books use instead of 4i, they use i0. It is very confusing. Best is to avoid all that confusion. Use this as a standard. All right. Cool. More questions on the screen. Beam of light with two wavelengths are used. Find the distance of the third bright fringe on the screen for this wavelength. What is the distance from the central maxima where the bright fringes due to both coincide? So you are using two colors, two wavelengths. First part is where will you get the third bright fringe due to this wavelength? Okay, let's do part number A first. Let's do part number A first. For A part, for bright fringe, the formula is nothing but myself. Yeah. N times lambda capital D by small d because it is the third bright fringe. So 3 wavelength is uh, 650. So 650 into 10 to the power minus 9 capital D mm, is not given or is it K is not given. So I will put it in terms of D only. And this will be basically small d. So this is how you get the first part. If small d and capital D are given, that's it. You will get the exact location, you know, on the screen. Makes sense, right? Okay. Now, first part is very easy. Pa problem is in the second part. Question says, where do you think both their, both their bright fringes coincide? Both their bright fringes will coincide. Now the formula for bright fringe is basically basically n lambda d by d. So bright fringes should coincide that means their y coordinates should coincide. That means n1 lambda 1 capital D by small d should be equal to n2 lambda 2 capital D by small d. Capital D and small d are same. They will also get cancelled out. So I will have n1 lambda 1 which is n1 into 650 is equal to n2 into 520. 0, 0 cancels. So, I will get n1 by n2 is nothing but 52 by 65. Oh, so these are the ratio of those numbers, ratio of those numbers which I have got, which means the 52nd fringe will coincide with the 65th fringe of the other wavelength. That is all that is going to happen. I don't think they have mentioned it right over here. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So 52nd fringe will coincide with the 65th fringe. But you need to be a little bit careful. The moment you see this ratio and you say that 52nd fringe will coincide with the 65th fringe of the other wavelength, you need to ensure that this ratio is in the smallest fraction. Is in the smallest fraction. If it is not in the smallest fraction, then it will not be the least distance because see the question says find the least distance where they coincide. So this ratio is not the least ratio. So what will you do? Divide it. What will you do? Divide it. Divide it by what? 3 or 15. Uh, sorry 13. I think it gets divided by 13. So 13 and goes with uh, 4 times and this goes with 13 5 times. This is the smallest ratio that you can probably get. Is that right? Everybody with me? Perfect. So 4 by 5, which means what? The fourth fringe, fourth fringe of, of 650 coincides with fifth fringe of, fringe of, uh, what is it? Uh, 520, 520. So that is the final answer. Fifth, fourth fringe of 650 coincides with fifth fringe of 520. Got it? This is how this has to be done. Get it in the smallest ratio. Or else 52 by 65 will coincide, but it will not be the least distance. Great. Great. Let's move ahead, my dear students. Let's move ahead, my dear warriors. Okay. So here comes another question up on your screen. Fringe width in a YDSC setup is measured to be beta. What will be the fringe width if the wavelength of the light is doubled? Separation between the slits is half and the separation between the screen and the slits is tripled. So many things are changing. What do you think will be the effect? Just formula based direct question my dear students. So beta 
is nothing but lambda capital D by D. So what have you done? The new beta will be the uh, the separation is half. The separation screen is triple. The what will be the fringe width? The wavelength of the light is doubled. So instead of lambda, you will put two lambda. Distance between the slits and the screen, you have tripled it. So 3D. So 3D. Correct. And distance between the slits, separation between the slits is half. So instead of small d, you are putting d by 2. So this will become 2 2s are 4, 4 3s are 12. So 12 times lambda d by d. This means beta prime is 12 times. What is lambda d by d? What is lambda d by d? It is the original fringe width. So it will become basically 12 times. So answer will be 12 times. Just check it out. Option D will be the correct answer. Right? Completely based out of fringe width formula. A similar question has come in NEET 2020. Right? The, uh, you know, the separation is half, distance is doubled. What will happen to the fringe width? Exactly same kind of question. Just the values are slightly different. You can see that. And you can do the same thing. It, you will see that the answer becomes four times using the formula again, lambda D by D. Because over here, separation between the sources is half. So D has become half times. Distance from the coherent sources is doubled. So into two times, two twos are four. So beta will become four times. That is what you get. So this was asked in NEET 2020. You can see uh, these kind of questions are very, very common. Now, Another variation which comes in Young's double slit experiment is this one, where you will see the setup is entirely immersed in a liquid. The moment you immerse the entire setup in the liquid, what happens? The speed of light in that particular medium, speed of light in that medium will be speed of light in air by refractive index. Wavelength of the light in that particular medium will also be wavelength in air divided by mu. But we all know, we all know that the fringe width will be lambda capital D by small d. Lambda capital D by small d. Is that right? Very good. So what you will see, because the wavelength reduces, you will see the new fringe width in that particular medium will be the old fringe width divided by mu times. Because you can see fringe width is directly proportional to the wavelength. It is directly proportional proportional to the wavelength. So if wavelength has reduced mu times, fringe width will also reduce mu times. So I can say that the wave pattern, the wave pattern shrinks, the wave pattern shrinks. Central maxima, central maxima is at the same place, is at the same place. Why does it shrink? Because mu is more than one fringe width reduces. So that is the reason why the pattern will shrink because of the wavelength reduction. This kind of variation you do get in your NEET exam. Another kind of variation is where you have a slab in front of the slits, where you have a slab in front of the slits. And in this kind of situation, what happens is the fringe width remains the same. Remains the same. But but the entire pattern, the entire pattern shifts by some amount. The entire pattern will either shift up or down. Now, why does that shift happen is a very interesting thing. I'll tell you why. Observe this carefully. Imagine this was your screen. Imagine your slits are here and here. This is S1, this is S2. Normally, the waves from both the slits would arrive simultaneously, would arrive simultaneously at the origin on the screen. But now, there is a problem. What is the problem? You have kept a small glass piece in front of one of the slits. What will happen because of that? The moment light travels through the glass, it will become slower because of this glass. You will see the light will become slower inside it. And because of that, you will see that the light won't arrive at the same time on the screen. There will be some gap. There will be some gap over here. Yes, this is the gap which I have shown. They will not arrive simultaneously 
on the screen because it has become slower. You have made it slow. The other ray is unaffected. Oh, so because of that, you will no longer probably get the central maxima over here. So no central maxima in this case. No central maxima in this case. So then you will think, where will they arrive together? Because if they arrive together, it will be constructive. And if they arrive together, also means it is the zeroth interference where togetherness is there. Hmm. Think about it. If I show them passing through the slab down over here, will they arrive together? I don't think so. In fact, problem will be if I go down, if I go down somewhere over here, nor not only is the ray number one slowed down, not only is the ray number one slowed down, but also it has now to travel some distance which is more than before. So I think the gap between them will be increased further. So they can't arrive simultaneously if you go down 100%. But imagine you go on the top. Imagine you go on the top. Let the ray number one go through the slab. But it has to travel less distance. Ray number two is not going through the slab. But it is compensating by traveling more distance. I think there is a good chance they will come together. Did you understand? The ray number one is slow, but for a shorter distance. For a shorter distance. Less distance it has to travel. So it compensates. It is slow, but you travel less. You are fast, but you have to travel more. So they compensate and you will see them meet together. And maybe you will see your zeroth, zeroth maxima over here. Zero at maximum over here. So that is why I said the pattern will shift. The pattern will shift. Similarly, imagine, my dear students, if these are the slits S1 and S2, this is the screen. But if you place the slab in front of slit number two, if you place the slab in front of slit number 2, then what will happen? Then you will see that the pattern will shift but below. The pattern will shift but below. This ray will be slow, but it will have to travel a short distance. So you will see the shift will happen below. You might also then think, sir, what will happen if there are two glass slabs? What will happen if there are two glass slabs? Well, that depends on whose effect is more dominating. S1 is there, S2 is there. Let's say there is one slab over here and then there is another slab over here. It all depends on the refractive index and the thickness. Refract index and the thickness. Refractive index and the thickness. So it could shift up also. It could shift down also. It all depends on their uh, you know, relative strengths. It will all depend on the relative strengths. So there will be a net shift which is produced. There will be a net shift which will be produced. So what is that shift which is produced, my dear students? The shift which is produced, the shift, the shift which is produced is given by the formula thickness into mu minus 1 into capital D divided by small d. You can also multiply it by lambda. You can also multiply it by lambda. You will see one very interesting thing. It will look like this. T into mu minus 1 into lambda capital D by small d and divided by lambda again. Lambda d by d is beta which is fringe width. So it will become so it will become nothing but T into mu minus 1 okay and uh, divided by lambda into beta if you want take that beta on the other side so it will look like this shift divided by beta is equal to t into mu minus 1 by lambda so if the pattern shifts by 5 fringes 7 fringes 8 fringes 10 fringes etc so the shift which will happen will be n number of fringes by which it has shifted into beta. The whole thing, the whole thing, I divided by beta again. 
the whole thing I divided by beta again over here. That's all I have done, right? Shift is basically some n number of shifts by into beta and divided again by beta as given in this particular expression here. So you will get this as t into mu minus 1 divided by lambda beta beta cancels. So n will be t into mu minus 1 divided by lambda. So direct formula based questions do come on this. Direct formula based questions. How many fringes does it shift by? There is a slab kept of thickness 5 millimeters, refractive index 1.5, wavelength 600 nanometers. Wavelength you know, thickness you know, mu you know. You can find how many fringes does it shift by. So number of fringes it shifts by is given by this particular. Is this absolutely clear my dear students? You should definitely know this main shift formula. This is the main formula. From that only you can get how many fringes does it shift by. How many fringes does it shift by. Clear? Give me a thumbs up. Light up the chat box. Let me just drink some water. Okay, let's move ahead. So we have seen Young's double slit experiment uh, with some variations like putting slabs, putting it in some medium. We have also seen Young's double slit experiment with double sources. What happens when you change the wavelength, when you change the distance? and all those things and even the intensity how does it change uh, when you uh, basically change the part difference all these kind of questions we have done related to intensity and so many other things so that is what is mainly there in uh, young's double slit experiment uh, so let's go to the final two things of uh, light waves and that is basically diffraction and nothing but uh, polarization so shift depends on the position of the slab uh, no, it does not depend where you place the slab, meaning even if even if uh, this slab is placed here, right, or here, doesn't matter. As long as it is coming in the way of that ray, the shift produced will be the same. Thickness and refractive index should be same. Okay, that's all that matters. After that, the shift produced is the same. Right. Cool. Oh, by the way, the net shift, what will the net shift be? If I talk about the net shift, the net shift will be shift number one, which will be produced due to first slab minus the shift number two, which will be produced due to the other slab. So you take both of them and find the modulus of it. That's all. Each one will try to shift in their own way and uh, you will get the net shift as simple as that. So delta stands for the shift over here. Now, what is this diffraction? In fact, I feel that it is best explained if i show it to you let me show it to you right over here what is a diffraction so instead of two slits let me get one slit over here and you know i will turn on the light source come on please turn on yeah see this what is happening do you see this light is spreading in all the directions and do you see the central region on the screen, the screen is over here. Part of it is bright. Can you see that? Part of it is basically bright. If you want, I'll just move the screen a little bit closer. You can see it is bright. The remaining part is dark. I can change this distance between the slit and the screen. You will see that the intensity will also change and so will the, uh, you know, region where it is bright. I think it is not seen so much. 
when you are really far like when you keep it close it is very easily seen yeah you can see that i can change the color also and you will see that uh the color on the screen will also change and so will the width which gets illuminated will change you can see that the light is spreading in that read you can very clearly see that the light is spreading in that read so this effect of spreading of light is called as a diffraction which is the bending effect of light and this can only happen with waves this will not happen with particles just imagine if particles had to go through it then those particles will directly go in the front only through that gap and on the screen only in the front they will not go as a spread out so this is a completely purely a wave phenomena it does not happen with any other thing we like particles okay you can see i am using different colors the light is spreading no matter what i can change the width of the slit you can see the pattern on the screen will also change now you can see that pattern is something like this okay i change the wavelength sorry slit width my bad if i change the slit width automatically the thickness on the screen will change thickness on the screen will also change you can see that very easily right over here the pattern behaves differently for different widths of the slit for different widths of the slit okay so this phenomena is basically called as diffraction another example is over here i have a laser beam there is a pin hole there is a hole in the cardboard box and there is a screen now we'll turn on the light look at the beautiful diffraction pattern which is formed on the screen because the hole is circular that is why the pattern is also circular if it was a slit you will get fringes if it is a circle you will get round round circles if it is a slit you will get band one band bright dark bright dark if it is a hole you will get circular fringes you will basically get circular fringes i can change the wavelength and you can see how the pattern will change the size will change the size will change right the locations of the bright and the dark regions will change can you also see it's only the central bright spot which is very bright central bright spot which is very bright but the later on maximas are not so bright the maximas which are coming up later on are not so bright right is the central spot which is like hitting your eye other things are just faded away you can also change the size of the hole see i'm making the hole big it looks like this so cool if i make the hole very small it looks like this so all depends on the size of the hole which is also called as the size of the aperture size of the aperture i can change it to different shapes if i make it square this is how it looks if i keep it a circle and a square it looks like this if i keep many dots this is how the diffraction pattern will look if i keep a random figure it looks like this it looks so distorted when you keep a random figure over here the hole is no longer circular it is made in a shape the interference which is being created the interference which is being created looks like this this is diffraction effects i can make the hole bigger or smaller i can make the hole bigger or smaller and this is how the diffraction pattern will change we don't have to study all that we just have to study slit related setup so we just have slits we don't have holes and other things in our neat syllabus so this is what diffraction is all about is the is the bending of light it's the spreading of light when it passes through a corner through a hole through an aperture through a slit that effect is called as basically diffraction i hope today now first time you have seen diffraction and i feel light waves has to be taught through visualization yes krishna because uh, you know just talking about it blah 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 you will be like ha ah, something is happening interference is there something is there but now i think you know what is diffraction what does it do exactly so this is going to have many effects in our day to day life now actually what happens is when you have a single slit when you have a single slit and this is the screen how 
do you exactly get that interference? There is a big theory for that. I'll just give you a gist of it, which is not there for need, but you should just know about it. The slit has many points in between, infinite points. Each of these points behave like secondary, secondary, second. Each of these points basically behaves like secondary sources. How many such secondary sources are there? Infinite. Infinite such secondary sources are there in between them. Each of them will produce their own wavefronts like this. Own wavefronts like this. And you will see that as these wavefronts grow in size, as these wavefronts grow in size, like this maybe. Okay, I'm just showing it randomly over here. You will see that the light would have spread by some amount if you draw like a common tangent because these are finite sources. So you would see that the light would have spread like this. This is like the common tangent to all of them. Something like this. It's like a common tangent. This is using Huygens principle. So you would have said, you would have seen that the light is basically spreading over here. So the light, the light spreads number one and these secondary wavefronts these secondary wavefronts what do they do they will interfere secondary wavefronts interfere they will interfere and that is the reason why on the screen that is the reason why on the screen you will get an interference pattern just like the Young's double slit experiment, but there is a big change that is the central maxima, the central maxima is very bright, very bright. Keep this in mind. Central maxima is very bright. The first maxima, even the first maxima on both the sides, first maxima on both the sides is actually very very faint like I showed it to you in that demonstration in that simulation. Very very faint. Second maxima is not seen only hardly seen. Second maxima is hardly seen is hardly seen on the screen. Okay and third fourth though forget it. So Basically, you will see that the central maxima is very bright. The bright region will end where the first minima comes. First minima comes. First minima comes. Do you see the pattern? Intensity wise is very different if you compare it with Young's double slit experiment. In Young's double slit experiment, first maxima, second maxima, third maxima, fourth maxima, all the maximas had similar intensities. But here, the maximas do not have the same intensities. That's a big difference from Young's double slit experiment to diffraction of a single slit or diffraction in a single slit. Do you see? There is a big, big difference between both of them. Great. So, you will see that on the screen, you will see, one second, you will see that on the screen, on the screen, you will have a very nice maxima and that maxima ends where you will get the first minima. That's the end border line of it. This is the first minima on both the sides. First minima on both the sides. This distance from the first minima on one side to the first minima on the other side this is also called as the width of central, width of the central maxima. What is this called? Width of the central maxima. Also, that central maxima will subtend certain angle, will subtend certain angle. So, I can just show it like this. So you remember your slit was actually over here. 
slit was actually over here. So this angle which it subtends delta theta that is basically the angular angular width of central maxima. Angular width of central maxima. Is that absolutely clear? What is the meaning of the width of central maxima and also the angular width of the central maxima? Correct. Now, what is the location of, you know, the first minima or the maxima, etc. Now, the formulas are exactly opposite of what you got for, what you got for, you know, your uh, sing, uh, double slit experiment. What you got for your double slit experiment. If you see it, you will be shocked. But that is how it is. We don't have the derivation, but you should know this. The minima is obtained where a sin theta is n lambda. I will explain this to you. Just imagine when you have to compare YDSC versus single slit experiment that is diffraction. That is diffraction. In YDSC, all maximas all maximas have same intensity, have same intensity. Here, the maxima intensity reduces. Maxima intensity reduces as you go away from the center. That is one major difference. In Young's double slit experiment, if you remember, our D sin theta was n times of lambda for a maxima and d sin theta which is the path difference was odd times of lambda by 2 for a minima d was the separation d was the separation between the slits that is how it was here in case of diffraction you will see d will not be given it will not be the distance between the slits Instead, what will be given to you? The width of the slit will be given. Understand that. The width of the slit will be given. This is the width of the slit. Understand the difference. Two slits are there. The distance, separation between them is D. Each slit will have its own width. So, we are talking about a single slit. The width of the slit has a different symbol. I will usually use the symbol A. So, here A sin theta a sin theta will be for maxima will be odd times lambda by 2 and for minima a sin theta will be n lambda exactly opposite guys for maxima and minima for maxima and minima they are exactly opposite do you see one major major difference so if you know this difference table right you will be uh, uh, you know, avoiding a lot of misconcepts and misusing the formula or getting confused between the two formulas. So that is what you will see over here also. Minima is A sin theta is equal to N lambda and maxima is A sin theta is odd times 2N plus 1 is odd times lambda by. Got it? Major difference. So when we talk about the width of the central maxima, what we need to do is the first minima, the first minima is obtained at y1 is equal to, for minima, the formula that you will use is, that's like it, the formula that you will use is a sin theta 1 is equal to n, n is 1 times of lambda. So basically sin theta 1 is equal to lambda by a. But if theta is small, only then, if theta is small, if theta is small, then sin theta 1 is also tan theta 1, which is equal to lambda by A. And tan theta, and tan theta, can you guess what tan theta will be? Think about it. Tan theta. I'll just draw a right angle triangle for all of you. This would be theta, this would be y, this would be d, distance between the slit and the 
screen. So tan theta will be basically y by d, y by d is equal to lambda by a, y by d is basically lambda by a. I hope it is understood, right? But the width of the central maxima, if I call it as w, width of the central maxima, if I call it as w, understand that width will extend from here till here. So this will be w, this will be w, be careful. So technically, w will be two times of y. Technically, w will be nothing but, remember, two times of y, which is what we exactly want to find. And from here, y is nothing but d lambda by a. So therefore, therefore, you will get the width will be two times d lambda by a. That is the width of the central maxima. 2 lambda d by a. This is only if theta is small, we can use it or else you have to use trigonometry. You have to use trigonometry, Pythagoras and all of that. Yeah. Now, similarly, yeah, we'll be doing Padma Padma uh, problem solving sessions just next week. Next week onwards, we are going to start something very amazing on the channel. Let me tell you that. Okay. Angular width. How will you get angular width? See, angular width, again, the same thing length of the arc formula length of the arc formula is nothing but radius radius multiplied by the angle use this length of the arc is basically the width length of the arc is basically nothing but the width radius is nothing but the distance between the screen and the slit which is just going to be d which is just going to be d so put d over here angle subtended is delta theta so width was 2 d lambda by a this is equal to d delta theta so from this what will you get delta theta delta theta dd cancels will become two times lambda by a this is the formula that you get this is the formula that you get is that clear understood everybody with me when are these formulas applicable when are they not applicable you should know all these derivations I have done for you. Okay? Right? And I have also given you the difference between Young's double slit and single slit experiment. Also given you the formula for location of maxima and minima on the screen. Okay? All these things are fine. I have given you the difference also. So let's see some questions coming up on the screen. This was asked in NEET 2015. When you have wave, light of wavelength, diffraction is produced. Width is A. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know these are the distance between the screen and the slit the width of the central maxima is we just did it imagine this direct question came but you know why this question was asked look at the options it is so damn confusing look at the options 2 d lambda by a d lambda by a d a by lambda 2 d a by lambda so 100 percent many students got confused and this happens see now here the theory is fresh. So, you'll be like, ah, sir, I know it. But in the exam, you will definitely get confused. That's why this question came. So, actual answer was 2D lambda by A. Okay. Now, an easy way to remember this is, I'll tell you what. Do you remember the fringe width formula? Do you remember the fringe width formula? What was the fringe width formula, my dear warriors? What's the fringe width formula? Lambda D by D. This is very easy to remember. So, in double slit, you have distance between the slits, that is small d. In single slit, you don't have small d, you have a, that's all you need to remember. And remember the width of the central maxima will be two times of this, two times of this because of this diagram. Part of it is on the top, part of it is below, so that is why two times, understand that. So that is why that number two comes, this is an easy way to remember the central maxima's width. Remember the fringe width formula, lambda d by d, replace small d with a and make it two times because it is partly on the top and partly below. Is that okay, my dear students? Understood how to do this? Okay. Another question which came in the uh, exam. The angular width of central maxima for wavelength is this much. When you use another 
wavelength the angular width reduces by 30 percent what is the wavelength of the light this was asked in need 2019 so angular width formula i just gave it to you right over here angular width is 2 lambda by a right 2 lambda by a so we know that angular width is basically 2 times lambda by a that means it is directly proportional to the wavelength so think about it if the angular width reduces by 30 percent reduces by 30 percent means what if you write down delta theta 1 by delta theta 2 if i write it as lambda 1 by lambda 2 if the old angular width was delta theta 1 the new angular width has decreased by 30 percent so remaining is 70 percent so it is 0 0.7 of delta theta 1 lambda 1 is 6000 Armstrong lambda 2 I don't know how many Armstrong it is delta theta 1 delta theta 1 cancels so I will just be getting lambda 2 as 6000 Armstrong multiplied by 0 0.7 how much do you get this as yes very good 4200 Armstrong 76 of 42 that's it 4 4200 Armstrong that is the answer this was a neat 2019 question just direct application of formulas will come so please don't ignore diffraction is what I would say another question which came was you know in need 2016 where angular uh, a width is given of the slit which is 0 0.02 centimeter and you know they gave a lens and uh, they asked you to solve the problem but don't get scared even if the width is given uh, of for a lens think of the lens like an opening like a slit and the light is passing through the opening which is made of that glassy material of, of some refractive index doesn't matter so it's at the end of the day a slit only yes the slit is not made of air it is made of glass that's the only difference but other formulas will remain the same so here again uh, you are just going to assume that the capital D in this case will become the focal length because that's where the image is formed and wherever the image is formed that is exactly the location where you will be placing the screen. So the distance between the screen and the slit the opening in this case is the lens will be the focal length which is 0.6 meters. The width of the opening is given to be 0 0.02 centimeters so into 10 to the power minus 2. Then uh, Lambda is also given 5 into 10 to the power minus 7 meters. The question is distance of the first dark band is asked. For minima, so for the minima, what is the formula guys? For minima, the formula is A sin theta is N lambda. N is 1 and lambda over here. And this sin theta is uh, over here. The question is what? Where do you get it? Sin theta, you can make it as tan theta tan theta is nothing but y by d so solving this you will get y is equal to lambda d by a you know lambda you know a you know d you know all the things you know all the things my dear warriors you know lambda you know d you also know a everything you substitute you will get the answer that's what exactly they have 0.15 centimeter solve this you will get the answer is that okay? Yeah. Such questions have come. That's what I wanted to show you in the need examination. Perfect. So diffraction is simple. I hope you visualize diffraction. I hope you now will never forget these formulas and the difference between Young's double slit and uh, diffraction pattern. Okay. That is all that is there in diffraction. You don't have resolution of images and all that. Earlier it was there in the syllabus. The resolution part has been deleted. Let's go to the last part which is polarization. Now this is the last effect and usually questions do come from polarization. I have usually seen if a question from polarization comes, usually diffraction will not come or if diffraction comes, polarization does not come. So usually, but yeah, there could be instances where both things come together. What is this? Polarizing means you are creating a biased effect in one place or in one direction. Like a teacher polarized the class, meaning uh, the teacher told some nonsensical things. 
these students are good, these students are bad. So now the class is fighting between each other. Why? Because they have got polarized. Because one group of students feel that no, I am the best. Other group feels no, why did they call uh, themselves as the best? So there is fighting. So you know you have polarized the class. You have given preferential treatment in a certain region or in a certain place or in a certain direction. Now light, when it comes usually from sun, from light bulbs, light is nothing but electromagnetic wave. Light is nothing but a electromagnetic wave. So let me show over here. Light is nothing but electromagnetic wave. So what you will see is uh, the electric field going like this and the magnetic field going like this. So if this is the electric field of the wave, this is the magnetic field of the wave. If somebody sees it from behind or in the front, they will see that the electric field is oscillating up and down, up and down, up and down. And the magnetic field is oscillating left, right, left, right, left, right. That is what they would definitely see. The direction in which the electric field vibrates, that is considered as the primary plane. This is So this is the plane of vibration. This is called as a plane of vibration of the light wave of that particular light wave of the light wave. Now the usual bulbs sources of light which you get. So a normal source of light which you get. It will emit light radiation in all the directions. And if you go to any particular place. I hope it is seen. Just happened. Ha, hang on. Okay. All right. So the light source will emit light in all the directions. This light, which you usually get from a source, does not have vibrations in a particular direction. Sometimes the vibrations of electric field are like this. Sometimes the vibrations are like this. Sometimes the vibrations are like this. They are basically in all possible directions. Because they are in all possible directions, sometimes electric field goes like this, like this, like this. There is no system over there. It's all random. So, when the vibrations, vibrations are not organized or they are not, you know, in a particular plane, not in a single plane like the one over here. In this case, we saw that the electric field was vibrating in this particular plane. Right? This was that plane in which the electric field was vibrating as the light moved. As the light moved. Yes. As the light. When the vibrations are not in the single plane, but they are in multiple planes, they, that light is said to be unpolarized unpolarized light and the usual light that you get is always unpolarized is always unpolarized but if the light has a plane of vibration which is only in one single plane like the one over here then this kind of light is said to be polarized light what is it said then it is said to be polarized light why because it has one unique direction it's not random. One direction is given preference over the other. So that is why I'm saying it is polarized. It is given preference over the other. That is why I'm saying it is polarized. Got it? The difference between unpolarized light and polarized light? Very good. Now what happens is, if you take, this is the symbol for unpolarized light, you show 
vibrations basically in all possible directions like this unpolarized light and you pass it through certain medium they are called as polaroids they are basically called as polaroids and these polaroids have a direction which is also called as the pass axis it is also called as the pass axis meaning along this line all the electric fields are allowed other electric fields or their components are not allowed so the pass axis allows the electric field and their components to pass that's why pass axis the perpendicular to the pass axis will stop the electric fields in that direction you will see if unpolarized light if unpolarized light of intensity i passes through such a polaroid which has a pass axis a preferential axis to pass the electric fields the light which comes out gets polarized the light which comes out gets polarized in that pass axis direction and the intensity basically becomes half this is very very important only those vibrations are allowed which are parallel to the pass axis so the pass axis allows allows the vibrations in its direction in its direction and blocks the vibrations perpendicular to it blocks the vibrations perpendicular blocks the vibrations perpendicular to it this is very very important is that clear yes so this is one important thing which you should know that the intensity becomes half okay when you pass unpolarized light another interesting thing is that another interesting thing is that if you have already obtained polarized light already obtained polarized light of intensity i but again you pass it through a polaroid through a polaroid and let's say the pass axis is making an angle is making an angle with the vibration of the polarized light let's say the angle is theta let's say the angle is theta you will see that the light which comes out is also polarized and it is polarized always in the axis of the pass axis or sorry along the line of pass axis so this light is again polarized along it is always polarized along the pass axis along the pass axis okay again it stopped lot of intermittent on and off is it seen yeah polarized along the pass axis and this intensity this intensity of the light which you get is original intensity into cos square cos square theta this law is also called as malus law this is also called as malus law very very important my dear students the intensity is slightly different it is i cos square theta okay this is called as malus so what kind of questions do you get from this on malus law okay imagine this was asked in need 2022 you have light which is polarized to some 10 units lumen is the unit of light intensity and it is passing through a polarizer angle between the direction of the polarization of the light and that of the polarizer so that the light output intensity is 2.5 so already you have light which is polarized of 10 units of 10 units and it has to pass through a polarizer pass through a polarizer or a polaroid which is making certain angle theta and the final intensity in units is 2.5 units so i think we can use malus law over here 
the final intensity 2.5 will be the original intensity into cos square theta correct so 2.5 divided by 10 is 1 by 4 so 1 by 4 is cos square theta so cos theta will be root of 1 by 4 which is half that means theta will be how much 60 degree because cos of 60 is half so hence the answer was beautifully mentioned as 60 such questions do come this is in just last two years who said need date has been extended sarah at least i don't know of such things okay please don't believe rumors if such things come up we'll definitely let you know okay don't spread fake news if it is not there if somebody has told you just verify it and i'll also verify if something comes up definitely i'll tell you yeah Padma, like I said, I'll be doing uh, special problem solving sessions uh, from next week. Guys, now next entire month is just purely problem solving. Padma and others, remember this and listen to this. PYQs, unseen problems, even some NCRT based questions. Separate, separate sessions will have. Mock test, separate. That is the only thing that we are going to do for the next entire month. Yeah, theory revision will be there, obviously. But that is the main concentration, what will we do? Now, two polaroids, P1 and P2, are perpendicular to each other. Unpolarized light is incident on P1, unpolarized. And a third polaroid is kept in between them, such that it makes 45 degrees with P1. What is the final intense, the intensity of light transmitted through P2? Okay, so let me just imagine this. There is one polarizer over here. The pass axis is like this. This is P1. The another polarizer is like this. The pass axis is like this. This is P2. The third polarizer is making an angle of 45 degrees like this. Now, if the original light is unpolarized as given in the question, so I will show un polarized light i will show unpolarized light i hope you guys can see this this is unpolarized light coming in through a polarizer the first thing that is going to happen is just like i showed it to you over here it will get polarized and the intensity will become half and the intensity will just become half so where did it go yes so the intensity will become half and it will be polarized like this along the pass axis so if this was i naught this will become i naught by 2 now the angle between the vibration and the pass axis is 45 degree so what will be the intensity over here i naught by 2 into cos square 45 i naught by 2 into cos square 45 because that is the angle between the vibration and the pass axis okay now this light will have a vibration like this in this particular direction. It is also polarized in nature. But that is also making an angle with the pass axis of P2. Pass axis of P2. How much angle? 45 degree. So whatever intensity is incident, cos square 45, you again multiply it with cos square 45. Agree? So what will it become? I naught by 2. Cos 45 is 1 by root 2. Square it, half. Square it, half. So it will become I naught by 8. That should be the answer. I naught by 8, which is option C, C for Captain Shreyas. Yes, Krishna. Correct. Padmavati. Very good, Shreyas C. Very good, Alec here. I hope this is clear. Uh, Tushar, uh, right now we don't have a Hindi medium crash course. Uh, but we have English crash course. And let me tell you, the English crash course teachers are amazing. Number one. Number two, they do not talk hi-fi English. Very simple English, just like me. Okay? We talk Indian English. We don't talk American or British English. So, we talk in Indian English so that our job is not to talk in, um, you know, that sophisticated high level English. Nobody is judging us on that. It's just so that everybody understands number one. Number two, we want to also improve your language because at the end of the day, you will be going and treating multiple patients from different backgrounds. You will be studying everything, all the literature also in English. So, we want you to get used to that because at the end of the day, you will have to learn in English to communicate with other doctors to understand the medical terms and right all those things okay now one last thing which is left in polarization that is brewster's law 
So we learned Malu's law. So what is Brewster's law? This is a very special effect where you pass an unpolarized light through a medium. So a part of the light gets refracted. Some part of it gets reflected. So you make the light fall. Part of it gets refracted. Some part of it gets reflected. In a special case, when the reflected and the refracted rays are perpendicular, when reflected light is basically perpendicular to refracted light, what you will see is the incident light, if it is unpolarized, the reflected light gets polarized. The reflected light gets polarized. So you will see that the reflected light is polarized, is polarized. And this happens at a very special angle of incidence. That angle of incidence is called theta b, also called as the Brewster's angle. Brewster's angle. And it so happens that tan of, tan of that Brewster's angle is going to be the refractive index of the medium. Tan of that angle, Brewster's angle, is the refractive index of the medium. That's called as Brewster's law. And this is polarization, not by polarizer, but by reflection and refraction. That is a special thing. Till before, we used to use polaroids, polarizers. Here, there is no polarizer. Here, you are using the phenomenon of reflection. All right. Why this happens and all that, you don't have to go into all those details. But uh, just remember, if reflected and refracted light rays are perpendicular, then the reflected light is polarized. And the angle of incidence when this happens is, uh, or the tan of it is refractive index. Yeah. For other angles of incidence, it is partially polarized. So I'll mention that also over here. For other angles of incidence, Right? For other angles of incidence, reflected light, reflected light is not completely polarized. It is partially polarized. It is partially polarized. It is partially polarized. So what kind of questions can come on that? Here is the question. Brewster's angle for the interface should be what? This was question in NEET 2020. Very interesting question. What is the range of Brewster's angle? Let's think. Mu is basically tan of the Brewster's angle. Here the angle which they have used, the symbol for that is IB. Okay, fine. We'll use the same symbol. We know refractive index will always be, refractive index will always be more than, sorry, Refractive index will always be more than 1 and it will be less than infinity. These are the two limits, lower limit and upper limit. That means even tan of that angle will be less than infinity and more than 1. Compare this with whose tan is 1? I think tan 45. So tan 45 is 1. Okay. So I'll, instead of 1, I will put tan 45. Whose tan is near to infinity? I think it is tan 90 degree. So everything is in tan, tan, tan. So remove the tan using sunscreen. So 45 is less than IB is less than 90 degree. That is the answer. That is the answer. So 45 less than IB less than 90 degree. This was asked in NEET 2020. Can you believe that? Yeah. So these kind of questions are asked in Brewster's angle. Sometimes refractive index is given. They ask you I. Sometimes the I is given. They ask you refractive index. That is direct substitution. So those were the questions, guys. And uh, we have completed light uh, waves. Obviously, there will be more problem practice, but the theory part, whatever is needed for you, is done. If you want derivations, I have done a special video on just derivations. I don't know how many of you have seen this before. If you want it as you are watching this uh, particular channel, let me show that to you. It's there over here. Okay. Uh, just go to... Without need English, go to live and go down over here. Go down over here, down over here, go down, go down, or you might just search for it also. That's okay. 
Mm. Where did it go? I've done it. Where did it go? Oh, it is there in videos, I think. Yeah, here. Sorry, it was there in videos. My bad. Not in the live. Derivations of class 12 physics. It's a big class, six hours class. I have given the recording completely of all the chapters, including light rays. So if you want that, please um, check out the derivations over here. Okay. I hope this is clear. It's there in the video part. And another important thing which I would like to uh, tell all of you is as you are watching this video, remember in the description box, there is a... Uh, oh, sorry. Not this one. Where did it go? Yeah. In this particular description box, you will be seeing the link for the, you know, crash course as well as me coming to Pune, Hyderabad, Vizag links. So just check those links out. Just check those links out. You will be uh, seeing the registration form. Why should you fill these forms is very important because we will get a headcount. We will be able to organize things for you properly because yes, there is going to be food. There are going to be goodies. All those things are going to be planned for all of you. So that is the reason why we want you to register if you are in one of those cities and if you cannot come, no problem. You can at least attend the courses online and at the centers, we are conducting free workshops for the need students. There is also a crash batch offline, which is starting on 21st. So all these things are available. Just visit your nearest center, see the facilities, see the teachers. You will be the best judge and I'm pretty sure you'll be impressed. Attend these seminars, which are being conducted and your respective cities fill the form so that you know the team can reach out to you. okay Chalo. so god bless you all i hope you have liked the session if you're not done that please do it and also comment in the session after the session that wave has been done or wave done wave optics done whatever so just put it okay so steve jobs just check out fluid dynamics lecture i have just conducted fluid statics and dynamics just few days back just see the entire lecture and then solve the problems and there will be special problem solving sessions just like I promised you. Okay. So please watch the theory part from my fluid dynamics session. Okay. Just conduct it through this. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care. Have a great time. Captain Shea signing off. Hasta la vista.